right. Well, uh, Josh, Travis, great to get with to chat with you again. Sarah, great to get to meet you uh, and to talk for uh, this film. I mean, I don't know what what really to say other than this is a roller coaster of a movie uh, that I, I just was blown away by. Travis, I'll come to you first. Um, I mean, you were you co-wrote this, you directed this. Where did the concept for this really come about? Uh, well, the concept of uh, uh, a man and a woman go into a cabin and the Furies uh, attacking him came from uh, Nathan Quadri, who wrote the original draft. And then uh, my work on the script was sort of reinventing the, the world that the story takes place in and reinventing the, the visuals and what the relationship was. But uh, so, I mean, all credit to him for recognizing the value of uh, telling a horror story with the with the Furies as the sort of Cenobites. And, uh, you know, then it was just a process of, like I've been telling other people, turning off the parts of my brain that, that sort of uh, analytically approach stuff and just turning on the part of the brain that's just like, let's get fucking weird. And that's what we ended up with. <laughs> And it, it was it was weird in all the best ways it, it that that i love the tone i love the atmosphere and i mean i love that it does also feel very much like an old giallo movie and uh both in its visual aesthetics and in i mean even the blood that we see was that always kind of the intention going in uh to to re recreate that old style yeah i mean it, because the story is sort of told from the characters perspectives which is an exaggerated sense of reality, it seemed to make sense to sort of lean into, you know, like the really theatrical blood. Like, I didn't want this to feel like uh, uh, a reality sort of uh, man killing a woman type thing. I wanted it to feel like a play a bit, you know? And I think those Diallo movies in sort of what they were doing with the production design and, and cinematography, all of that sort of heightened reality. So that was our, our additional template. Well, it, it, it really does add uh, extra layers to the film that I love. And Sarah and Josh, I will come to you two next. What about this material really sparked your interests to want to be a part of the film? Gosh. Oh, I mean, for me, <clears throat> uh, well, it's Travis, whose work I immensely admired, had um, uh, sent me a DM asking me if I wanted to read some new script. And I was like, oh boy. Uh, and I cracked it open, and it <clears throat> truly was like, holy shit, this is Patrick Bateman at the Evil Dead Cabin. This could be really, really fun. Um, and sometimes you read sort of things where you, you know, uh, you know, it'll be either be a challenge or or too much of a challenge or it's something you can kind of roll out of your bed and do. And this was a combination of that. Um, it's not quite fun to just roll out of bed and just be able to do a thing. I hadn't quite played vulnerable or hadn't quite played seductive and, you know, truly scary in this way. And um, so it was a, a combination of that and also just the practical effects of it all and just reading through the visual deck that Travis said on. I was like, oh no, this is going to be great. This is going to be <clears throat> truly an homage, not to Dead by Dawn, but to the first Evil Dead, to the early Raimi stuff, to the, you know, the, the true horror fan loving Jalo. Um, and even Hammer films to a degree, I was like, once I, once I saw that color palette as, as someone who grew up with all the Christopher Lee of it all, I was just like, oh, this is going to be, you know, really, really fun. Yeah, similar. I, as soon as I read the script, um, I mean, a, a, so much of what you see in the, the movie, all of what you see in the movie was very clear in the script. And it reads in a very similar way to the, the way, you know, it plays. And I loved it. Like, I just think it's really cool and unusual and uh, love the themes it danced with. Uh, love the visuals love the the references to artists i've never heard of and yeah and, and i and i thought Ke uh, meredith was also like a, a really interesting take on the i don't know final girl or the terrorized woman or like the you know the the, the woman in horror where she um she holds her own in like a, an interesting and unusual way for a movie like this so i was stoked as soon as i read it <laughs> I love how she turns the tables. Uh, I at 
that midpoint uh, that I don't want to spoil per se, I was like, oh, oh no. And then it was like, oh yes, keeps going. Um, Josh, I'll come to you next. You, you touched on it a little bit briefly, but I mean, as I, as you can see behind me, uh, we, you are no stranger to the horror genre, but it's t- generally from more of a comedic lens than, than strict horror. What was it like for you diving into this, you know, very serious, uh, tone in comparison to your, your prior works? I mean, it was super fun. Um, I think because I, uh, I knew, and just in speaking with Travis, there was, this is an absurd character. It, it, it's not like I'm going in and, and trying to have like, you know, um, uh, a, a, a marathon man moment. It, it's definitely more of an homage. I mean, his name is Bruce. Um, it is an homage in many different ways. Um, and I think, you know, Travis is, is, a very with it visionary filmmaker and producer, I think, and I think he would have taken the risk and, and seen, seen that, um, uh, seen in me an opportunity to be able to bring this thing to life. If, you know, um, uh, if, if he didn't see that, he certainly wouldn't have, you know, DM'd. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that he did. So it was, it was more fun than anything because it was, it was the kind of stuff that I, I kind of longed to do or playground. I longed to, to play in, but he was like, well, you know, I'm not probably not going to quite go this route or that type of project won't quite find me. Maybe someday when I'm older, you know, whatever. And I'm I'm really glad it did because I was a horror fan before I was a comedy fan, you know? So it just became, um, you know, another like bucket list item check. And I I just want to add to to that, like, like Bruce as a character has to have uh, a skill set that allows him to accomplish his his objective, and his objective is to disarm women, get them to trust him. And what I, you know, when I watch Josh's films, I think the thing that I really spark to is is like how in control he is in his performances, and and the humor is so it's 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 charming, and like his ability to land the joke. But then give a little space, like if, as a viewer, I lean into your your work, Josh, the the, the work that you've made, not you as a person, but your, the work that you've made. <laughs> no, and and I and I yeah, like, yeah. that was what was like fascinating. I was like, this would be a really great skill set for Bruce to have, which is just this sort of like, oh, I really like this guy, you know. And yes, uh, obviously playing a uh, uh, a bit uh, sexier and debonair. Uh, as well but i do think well the idea of the mask too i mean just the the veneer of it all like that's that's what that's what was exciting and what what, you're just kind of remembering now what it was is like oh that was the acting challenges the veneer all these guys wear masks and and that was what was so fun about this part is you get to play the you know i've done it so many times as someone who, who people ask to be on or has been on as my defense mechanism and i've done so many things and people walk away and you know I know what that's like, and this there was it was so great to play in that like liminal space and to see someone like this in private time um, is what's up. I mean, you you see Sarah in it too. You see Meredith in the bathroom is one of my favorite scenes. She's putting on the mask to compose herself to get out of there alive. Um, and also, what unfortunately so many women have to do in these you know situations, dating in today's world, you don't know who you're going to a cabin or to dinner with. Um, that's a horse of a different color, but anyway. So on that note, then, uh, I mean, a lot of the film revolve, at least the early parts of the film revolve around this awkward getting to know each other dynamic between you two. And I'm curious what that was like for both you, Sarah and Josh, developing that rapport and that dynamic with one another uh, prior to and during filming. Um, We had a lot of um, long discussions, the three of us did um, in the week or two leading up to filming. Um, not exactly rehearsals, but we, we read through the script a lot and, and just talked about it a lot. So we all, I think we're really confident going into it that we were on the same page. And then I think the first stuff we shot was in the car, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. Car, um, th- that was our first day and, um, you know, I think I think we would have gotten there anyway because the script sort of dictated it. But it's it's always nice when like 
uh, we were able to get to know each other acting in a scene where Jimmy and I were trying to get to know each other too, you know. So I think it, I think it really lent itself well to that. That was a, that was a very generous bit of scheduling on the part of the, the producer movie. brain. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, anything to add to that? I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, it was like you know the the. Uh, the so much of what we do is is pretending there's history or pretending there's you know the, there's no history or history when there's no history uh and uh i think the most fun part of getting to know any you know uh one another um through reading it and sitting down was just like oh oh i, I could i can tell this isn't going to be a bleak summer camp experience like sarah likes to have fun and take swings the way that i think we recognize there's that kind of like gene in us where we just like oh let's just fucking do it or let's just play or let's just stop talking about it and just yeah. dance or whatever and that's i think why we were so down you know so down to just do everything you see in the film you know including the, the last scene which is kind of a last minute decision it's not to speak for travis but like hey let's just try this <laughs> it just ends up being this you know this thing people talk about because you know, that's just what, that's just what the troop was and how we were, you know, all vibing. So actually I did want to go off of that because again, I don't want to get into spoilers, but that final shot is just so fascinating to me. And I know that this was of course done before Pearl, but since it's also coming off of Pearl, which similarly holds that uh, as the end credits roll, Travis, what was it, you know, how did you go about figuring out you wanted to do this for this film? Well, I had snuck onto the set of Pearl while I was filming. <laughs> and I was like, I'm tired. You know? <laughs> ran back to New Jersey. And, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, when you see the film, the the effect of it, you hopefully feel. But intellectually, it's just the idea of sort of, for the first time, showing the audience a different a perspective on the events that are happening, because up until that point, we're seeing things through a very biased uh, perspective. Um, and, you know, just by that point of making the movie with these two, we could go for something uh, as, as, as uh, big and as, as risky as that, um, because we had trust and we were, you know, pretty, pretty in harmony. And, it was just exciting. It was one of the more exciting things in any of the movies that I've made because it is so, um, it's so simple in what's happening and therefore it's so complex because the, the process of making the movie is not getting in the way, you know, resetting lights and moving the camera around and going into touch up makeup. You're literally just sitting there filming two actors act, uh, in, almost like a security camera point of view and it was uh you know really really invigorating for me so in putting two actors just in one location i mean the the setting for this i i love the layout i love the production design was that all kind of already imbued with the house uh or the sets when you uh first started putting them together or did you really uh, work with the production designer to have a, a specific look uh, for them. Uh, in the script, the, the you know we had defined what that house needs to look like because there's a there's a basically we start the story in the cold modern world that Bruce is in control of, and then we end the story in the sort of uh, wild uh, wilderness that Meredith and, and the Aaron is are sort of in control of. And the house is the uh, sort of train station in between. Um, so cold, modern, the type of house that Bruce would be, uh, you know, very proud of. And then we just started the process of looking for it. And then once you find what you can afford on your budget, then you tinker with what's there. So um, the house, the tinkering we did in this was sort of augmenting the house with the artwork and, uh, sort of choosing what parts we were going to show, what parts we weren't going to show to sort of create that illusion of everything being a very uh, precise and, and intentional uh, design thing, which I think is like important for Bruce's character. I think Bruce is super concerned with how things look and how he's perceived. 
And so in what we were showing in the house, couldn't just show like the laundry room or like, you know, you can, everything needs to be like the coolest thing. It, it definitely does uh, uh, go well with the character, like you say. It it, it helps with that veneer, uh, like you both have, have been talking about. Um, and the visuals, uh, as the film goes on towards the uh, second and third act, are just mind-boggling, uh, to say the least, but also really powerful to see. And Sarah and Josh, I'm curious, what were your first reactions like when you saw you know, some of these visuals uh, during filming. Oh, man. I mean, when you, one of the best things about not, the, the, the effects being practical is you get to interact with them and like add to to them, you know? Um, if you get a lot of ideas. Everyone starts getting ideas. They just start like bouncing around. And if you yeah, can't see what it's going to look like, it's a lot harder to, sort of like spark to it. So like to Tiffany's entrance, the big like music moment with the with the fabric was so much fun to play with. It was like, okay, that's what that's gonna look like. And then the cameras, okay, and so like what can we do this and that? And um I wasn't there for the like uh dick so. snake stovepipe <laughs> scenes filming day but i wish i had been i mean like to fight with a puppet like it's so it's so much fun uh and i find makes the job a lot easier uh, and more fun for me if, if i'm interacting with practical effects in real time I don't know what josh but josh that was exactly josh up here like I think that's one of the times when I was just so incredibly grateful to you. It's like, all right, Josh, so your character is going to have this very, very intense monologue <laughs> where we're going to, we need to feel his bullshit because he's like pleading his case right now. And then he's going to turn around and he's going to swing <laughs> a stove thing at this guy. And, and there's a guy in a green suit controlling the puppet. And Josh is like, all right, intense, 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 intense. Oh, yeah. I was like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So just like harder to the right, so harder, like uh, really put your back in it. It's just like literally <laughs> fraggle rocking left and right, uh, but still <laughs> intense, you know? Um, that's the best part. I mean, that's, the, you know, I think it's like why we do all this stuff is that all this stuff I think we've all been most affected by are the things that were assaults on the senses, even if it was just a straightforward horror or straightforward comedy, they get us kind of on all sides of the palette. And that's what was so fun about creating you know, that scene in general. I think the fabric scene was so wonderful. I remember actually reading that scene on my couch um, and imagining reacting to it and how it would look, <clears throat> knowing that it was going to be practical, 40 feet of fabric flying in the air. And then you're actually there in the woods, in the misty, dark, cold woods, and you're seeing the entire production team navigating fabric with wind machines and everything else. And you're, and, you know, you're really able to react to this like spectral giant um, one of my favorite moments, I think, to watch other actors do react to a kaiju or react to some larger thing that, you know, Spielbergian kind of like looking up at the, you know, that, that stuff is so exciting. And just, I was like, oh, oh, that's going to be that, you know? And then you see it with Vol's score, which is 70 is revealed. And it's just like, you know, fuck off, Chris Nolan, like bomb. It was just so, <clears throat> so intense. So rad. So that was, that was definitely the one. And then also just to, just to see all the all the furies together was you know was really phenomenal. I mean, Eric Bergen's work on this film, or, or wardrobe designer, artist, sculptor, genius, is just like oh no these these are real these are real things. These are not costumes. These are the, these are entities. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. That fabric scene uh, was it. I mean, that when I saw that, I was like, oh, I'm I'm excited for what other practical effects this film has in store uh, as it goes on, because it was uh, breathtaking to see. Uh, and I see I'm about out of time. So I'll just go ahead and wrap now. And and thank you all so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, Travis and Josh, always great chatting with you. Sarah had a great time chatting with you as well. And I really look forward to spreading the word about this film. I, I think people, uh, especially horror genre fans, are, are going to love it. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you, Grant. 